So, so welcome everybody uh, to our last session of the Owning Up to the Urban Lecture Series 2023, uh, developing collaboration between the Master of Urban Design degree programs at the University of Virginia and the University of Michigan. Today, we are truly excited to welcome Roger Sherman. We are the faculty co-hosts of the series. My name is Maria Arquero de Alarcón and my colleague, Mona. Thank you. Good Thank evening, everyone. Um, we just give you a quick overview of the semester's uh, lecture series. This semester, we are specifically interested in featuring novel organizational infrastructures in which the design disciplines strategize on experimental approaches to address urban complexity and uncertainty. Often embedded in the context of academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, or larger professional firms, the lab, the center, and the cluster often productive offer productive configurations where research and design methodologies can be experimented with, challenged, and innovated. This lecture series is examining the formation of these organizational units, their actors and operational logic, and the work emerging from them. Our guests are discussing their projects temporal and in spatial scale, access to funding and resources, the strategies for engaging diverse publics, and the experiences to advance co-production. As a part of their presentations, guest speakers will reflect on the following aspects of their work. Agency, methods, actors, actions, funding, mm -hmm. and potential replication. And with this, I'm handing it over to our student moderators who are going to present, introduce Roger Sherman to us tonight. I would like to introduce Roger Sherman. He is a design director and leads the Urban Impact Group and the Stone Soup Group at Gensler LA, uh, which incubates design strategies and solutions that not only address problems of contemporary urbanization, that is how to manage change and climate economic disruption, working at the nexus of digital technology and public space, uh, new and expanded forms of community and housing equality and affordability amongst others. SSG's radical incrementalism works through the development of prototypes that achieve wider impact by being brought to scale. The group's urban design work ranges from, in, uh, from an infrastructure and development plan for the northeastern Haiti to two uh, riverfront parks uh, in Wuhan, China, to a pilot uh, smart furniture installation for the LA Depot of Transportation, to a pilot resiliency, a resilience hub in Compton. Its urban awning supportive housing prototype won a coveted PA award from Architecture Magazine and a design award from Fast Company in 2021. So prior to joining Gensler, Roger was director of Roger Sherman Architecture and Urban Design. His work was featured at TEDx and MoMA in Newsweek and on CNN and at the Venice Rotter Rotterdam and Chicago Architecture Biennials. In 2006, Sherman with Dana Kauf co-founded Sitting Lab, an urban think tank at UCLA, where he is an adjunct professor. Uh, Sherman is the author of three books, including LA Under the Influence, The Hidden Logic of Urban Property, Real American Dream, Six Housing Prototypes for Los Angeles, and with Kauf, Fast Forward Urbanism. He has taught and lectured widely, including at Harvard, Princeton, Michigan, UC Berkeley, New York's MoMA, and TEDx. So let's welcome Roger. Thank you. Is that my clue? Uh, yep. Cue to get on? Okay, let me, uh, do I need to share a screen or are we good? I think you can share your screen. Okay, great. How is this? Everybody can see? Great. Thank you all for having me. And again, uh, compliments to the organizers of the series. I was really, really um, uh, pleased to, to kind of read the uh, frame framing of the conference uh, and the particular prompts that were provided because they're exactly uh, they're exactly in sync in line with the kind of way of um, kind of what I've been working on over most of my career, but more particularly over the time that I've been practicing since founding City Lab in 2006 with Dana and uh, and what you'll see of the work of Stone Soup, which we um, 
which I've been working on here at Gensler. That is to say that my project is really not, is, is something with a capital P that goes beyond the individual projects, but it's a, it's a design of a way of working, not just a design of the projects themselves. So the, again, my compliments to the organizers, the, the, there really was a kind of a laser focus on understanding the work behind the work. That is how, how the operating system itself um, is set up and it took, um, a number of years to begin to really refine this idea and to apply it to projects. So I'm going to be starting by talking a little bit about what exactly the Stone Soup Group is and how we how we kind of operate. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually surprised at the number of people who don't. Um, Stone Soup is a that that expression that. That title is something that refers to a children's uh, fable that uh, that I read to my own children that a number of people who are probably young parents know something about. It's a story of a of a soldier of a homeless man, appropriately enough, because much of we do watch much of what we do is um, homeless housing, not all of it, about a half of what we do. But the the homeless man is actually a returning soldier from a war who who walks into a village and asks, goes around door to door, asking everyone, diff different members of the village, if they can, um, if he can, uh, they can contribute to him uh, some food that he can eat. And uh, one by one, uh, the, the, the residents uh, turn him down and say, no, thank you. And they close their do the door in his face. He asks for carrots and celery and potatoes and salt and pepper. Um, but then he has an idea which is really the, what's beautiful about this story, which is he finds a rock by the side of the road and he, he finds an old pot that's been discarded as well. And he puts, the pot, he puts the rock in the pot, builds a fire, pours some water in it and feigns um, the, uh, to cook a soup, to be cooking a soup by the side of the road, um, making gestures as if to smell how good the soup, the soup, um, is um, is tasting or will be tasting, and sure enough, one one by one, the same people who refused him food before now come out of their doors one by one uh, to see what to see what he's making, and not only do they come out to see what he's making, but they bring the ingredient that he that they had previously refused him to contribute to the soup, and thereby the soup becomes the uh, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy where they realize in effect the benefit of getting in return for their contribution something larger than they they them they individually possess that is to say they get a whole soup a whole the 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 um pleasure of tasting a full full ingredient soup um, whereas they only had one ingredient before and in we use the metaphor of the stone really as a way of understanding what um, what the power of ideas to attract the client and to create a project, what we call design strategy as a business plan, in which design, programming, funding, site type, and other factors are really like the ingredients um, or catalysts that in the right combination become, a, become the recipe uh, for a project that has the power to um, to really become, uh, to basically create itself. This was something that ironically was entirely new to Gensler. Um, they work in an old, kind of in a, in a more traditional fashion in which relation, it's through, it's through existing relationships with clients that they're able, that they get most of their work. And so when they saw what I was doing, which was basically using the idea as a way, I, I, I have to admit it's, it's really kind of retrospectively something that I cribbed from the tech industry through startup culture, whereby somebody comes up with an idea and they go to vet, what are called venture capitalists to say, would you contribute? Would you give me money for this? Your, your yield will be many times greater than your, than your investment if you believe in the power of my idea. And like magic, um, it, it has an amazing ability. Now, I'm not going to discount the fact that I work on a platform at Gensler that enables me to make a call to anybody in the world and they'll take my call. But beyond the fact that I'll get, I'll get somebody to take my call, it's the idea that I present 
that will get me past the front door to begin to enter into a conversation with those folks. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit um, uh, today, uh, just at the beginning, is unpacking the idea of stone soup in terms of how we work, what, what the problems are that we explore, um, who we are like, and who we work with, and where we work as well. Probably the least important, but um, something having to do with bringing things to scale. These first, these first diagrams are really, really important. They're the kind of essential um, kind of um, thesis of the, of the stone soup group. So this is a kind of example of something in which we will take an idea and we will, that idea will begin to accrue things that attach to itself, other things that come with it as a means of beginning to build a larger molecule out of an atom um, to, that, are that is necessary to get the project to launch. So in this particular case, uh, we're, I'm referring to a project that's called Urban Awning, which I, I'm not sure if I'm showing you today or not, but it's an idea that's related to low cost housing and also has to do with, um, with using more passive mechanical systems. It was the project that won a PA award, but it began, my point is that it began without a client. It began just with an idea that we knew was saleable and made a lot of sense because it made so much, it was so uh, uh, commonsensical and would save so much money that we knew that people would be interested in it. Then after that, we, we using the beginnings of that idea that we've then started to put together, um, we were able to attract resources in the form of the Carpenters Union, uh, which is the Federal Carpenters Union, which uh, was which is located in Los Angeles, and also um, a special mayoral nonprofit um, in Los Angeles, which has private uh, philanthrop philanthropic money to fund it. So the Carpenters Union um, had its own motive to get involved with this because it had a training center and it had a need to demonstrate. It had a, a not, it had a nonprofit foundational arm of the union that was that wanted to, to, to demonstrate publicly that the carpenters were committed to solving the homeless crisis as well. So they ended up contributing in the form of a, um, of a full scale mock-up of the prototype uh, pro or prototype of the project itself that we could then take uh, many government officials to go visit. Based upon that, um, as you can see here, we were able to attract clients in the form of the Salvation Army with land and also with funding um, to actually uh, fund, to finance uh, and build the first pilot uh, version of this project. Um, so all of our projects work kind of in that, uh, sort of in that fashion. Um, we, uh, in that sense, there are five basic principles to how we work. We, as you're getting a sense, we are a kind of research-driven do tank, meaning we're not just a think tank like you would find in Washington that issues white papers, but we actually are interested in, in applied research um, in which the theory is built in and tested via projects, which we incubate through Gensler and find clients who are interested in, in funding a beta version of a project with the idea that if it actually proves out, there will be a real project that will be built upon it. So the risk level is fairly low at the startup in this, in this incubation phase. Secondly, we're very interested in transdisciplinary work where we're working with experts from other fields, whether it's in um, climate change and environmental systems, or it's in um, homeless services or um, that sort of thing. Uh, which exert a kind of gravitational pull on, on our own disciplinary um, expertise to kind of lead us into areas of innovation that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to force ourselves to do because we believe that it's through the exertion of a gravitational pull from the outside that architecture can venture into areas that make it more, that expand the envelope of what architecture is capable of doing um, and creating. 
S thirdly, we're very interested in cause in cause and effect based thinking. We're not interested in the symptoms of something. We want to dig down deeper to figure out what the actual causes are and to root out and to address the causes of those problems rather than simply ameliorating um, the effects with different solutions. Fourthly, um, we don't assume that at, even as urbanists, that urban design is the natural scale at which to solve urban problems. Every urban problem, however large, is finds its solar plexus or its nexus at a different scale. However big, meaning even the largest problems can be may turn out to be solvable, best solved at very small scales, but repeated versus assuming that you operate first at the large, at the macro and work your way down to the micro. That is, uh, I think in many ways we are, we are architects. We, we try not to be, uh, we try to be agnostic about the fact that even though we're, we're trained as architects, that we, are, we try not to be biased by the fact that as architects, we, that we would assume that the solution to every urban problem is architectural or that as urban designers, that every solution is urban design oriented. We try to be very, very clinical about trying to understand the point of entry into each solution. And that in and itself is extremely important. If I left you with nothing else today, it would be the idea of trying to figure out the natural scale at which to enter or attack a certain problem. And the fifth one, which I think really does distinguish ourselves as urbanists is that every project is not seen as a one-off, but actually as a potential prototype that achieves impact through repetition and scalability, which means that if you think about something as a prototype, you always have to test even the one-off, the, the individual instance, in terms of its elasticity or its adaptability to change, whether that's a change in funding source, a change in program, a change in site or climate or market conditions. Change is something meaning that we're, does it change, do, does it have the ability to be built in other climates or in other locations? Does it, ability, does it have the ability to change as our climate changes? Meaning it doesn't change in, in place, but it does change over time in one place. Um, different dimensions of changeability, which is the true definition of what people term resilience. So this diagram is kind of a kind of a little bit oversimplified uh, version of what I'm trying to explain here, which is basically saying that each idea, in this case, urban awning, which I explained, showed you earlier, how at the beginning you have simply the kernel of an idea, which is a prototype. But as you pass that through the test of differing sites, such as industrial or warehouse sites, or where you um, or contaminated sites, you need to build into it more complexity because you realize that it has vulnerabilities um, that that are not well suited to certain conditions that you then need to modify the idea in order to address. Uh, you have contingencies of use, for instance, if it's conceived of only as affordable housing, then what would happen if it also if you really want it to also be a prototype for transitional housing, which is a form of homeless housing? Um, you have regulatory constraints um, that affect that affect uh, cost. You have construction methods, climate response, funding requirements, community demands, all sorts of things that, as you put them through these filters, the idea causes the project to have to be modified. The question is how you can keep the, the idea in its essence, but enable the idea to be modified to such a point that it actually is able to work to arrive at a point of realization. Because in order for it to be realized, it needs to address or have the ability to adapt to all these, these seven or eight different um, contingencies that, I, that, I, that I'm outlining in this, um, in this slide. The problems that we are that we like to explore. What's interesting about this is right now there are a, we we kind of did a little bit of a. I can't say that we l laid this out at the beginning before we started working on projects. I think it's important to appreciate, especially as a practitioner and a recovered academic. With apologies to my colleagues, 
in Virginia, um, that I discovered that oftentimes the circumstances can become the basis for your theories, as opposed to starting with a priori theories and then applying them to circumstances. So in this particular case, we, we, we developed the slide retrospectively after having worked on many projects, and we really gleaned that there were five themes that we began to discover were um, that were common to many of the projects that we've worked on. And I'm gonna talk about these, these five over the period of time that I go through the projects. The first is what I call mining the gap, which is about excess capacity, meaning things that are too big and finding um, opportunities to build more functionality into things that are overly large or obsolete. Secondly is managing change. Um, of course, you could say managing change um, applies to all the all of the other four of these, but I'm going to say that it's just an umbrella for all sorts of other things related to, say, climate and so on, um, but not exclusive of that. The third is new forms of community, especially in the age of social media. That's a major. That's one of the major uh, kind of. Um, causes of change in community building, um, but it's not the only one. New forms of public life, um, again, which has a lot to do with the digital, but it also has to do with all kinds of other things in terms of um, how social life has been affected through, the, uh, through changes in the economy as well. Um, and the last one is uh, what I call building equity rather than affordability, because what I'm referring there to is not just figuring out how to build housing and other things cheaper. I'm talking about actually finding mechanisms by which people can build wealth who don't have a lot of wealth, which is really primarily the, the way that most of us who are more privileged uh, build our own wealth, which is through ownership, uh, especially in this country. So we constructed this um, this constellation of the of the interests that I outlined earlier of these five topics, and all of the uh, all of the words that you see in black and smaller type are the names of projects that we arrayed um, around these five themes. And as you can see, in a number of cases, uh, for instance, the one in the center called Placer, Placer County. That was a, a town center that we developed next to a, a county civic center. There, there are many projects that don't just adhere to one, to gravitate around one of the themes, but actually plug into three, two or three of them. Placer is an example of one that actually uh, connects to, to three of the five. This is actually rather radical for Gensler because Gensler organizes its offices according to what are called practice areas. That means to say that you, we have an office here of 600 people and we have 14 practice areas that are divided, that are categorized by what the building type is that you work on. So you have airports and you have, wor you have um, workplace and you have office buildings and you have residential, but we don't care about that. We don't think that what we do is really related to the building type. We're interested instead in the five themes, the five problems, which may grow into more problems over time. But it doesn't matter if you're dealing with climate change, whether you're working on an office building or you're working on an airport or you're working on a um, or housing, you have to deal with that problem. And we're trying to basically put the problems or themes to privilege those above or give primacy to those above the the exigencies simply of typology and use, which is we think a kind of more transdisciplinary way of thinking. Who we are like, we are like pirates. We are like alchemists or chefs, script writers, gene therapists, hackers, contrarians, brokers, scouts, double agents. I think what you can see in all of these uh, are different aspects of the fact that we work with existing material and we cut it together, almost like a DJ, um, kind of mixing materials together in a way that is really post-ideological. I would say it's not non-ideological, it's post-ideological, meaning again, we don't come with an a priori idea of what we want to build, that our projects all look the same. Instead, we have a way of thinking and a way of working 
a, a, an operating system that we apply to every project as a different set of circumstances. And we work with those circumstances, the externalities, and how we work with that is what makes us who we are. Um, the other thing that makes those things, makes us like those different job descriptions is that our clients are not singular. There's no one client, but there are, that may be one person who pays you, but the person who pays you is not necessarily your only, own, own, only client. There are aggregations of diverse stakeholders that accrue around every project. And that like stone soup, each has access to, I, to that may, has, as may have access to land, capital, management and operations, political context, that's akin to the carrot, the celery, the pepper, the salt, or the, you know, or the potato. They, you need all of those to make the soup. And that even though one and maybe the one paying you, you need all of them to make the project. Everybody, in some ways you could say that the shortage or the, um, or the, um, the kind of, uh, paltry resources in this country, the fact that nobody has everything, is what makes us be so instrumental as architects, because we are the connector between all of those different parties. And we are constantly brokering deals where we find out where, the pers where each agent's vulnerabilities are or weaknesses in terms of resources. And we find a person to provide the, the resources that any one of them may lack. So they, they stick together like a molecule because they need each other. If one person had everything, there wouldn't be a need. There's no Medici anymore, no Vanderbilt, no Roosevelt. You actually, everybody only has a little bit of what's necessary, needs, needs other things. And that is, the, that is the thing that we don't see as a liability. We see it as an asset for us, as empowering. Because if we can assemble the team and find all the ingredients, that puts us um, de facto in a role of control of the project because we're the ones who assembled it. Um, it also enables the project to serve as a tentpole that forges inclusivity and widens ownership um, of the project beyond just one person dictating how they, um, how and what they want. So these are just, this is just an example of in our little group of some of the many stakeholders and different groups that we work with. This is a little trick, this slide that I learned from Gensler, which is they'll, they'll invite a client in and the client comes in thinking that, okay, we're gonna see if we wanna hire Gensler. And so they think they're in control because they come to Gensler and they go, okay, well, we have four people on our short list. Do you, you know, give us the dog and pony show. And then the amazing thing I noticed was that Gensler puts up a slide like this, except they're usually like 50 of these things. And suddenly the client, you can see very subtly, the client who's interviewing Gensler leans in ever so slow, so slightly toward the screen. And they realize that Gensler has all of these people in its network, Fortune 500 companies. And suddenly the table turns and it's all about whether or not the, the Gensler um, wants to work with the client, meaning whether the client wants to, you know, how badly do you wanna work with us? because we can provide you something that you don't have, which is our network. It's not about our services that we provide, it's about the connection to tenants, to other funding sources, to land, et cetera, et cetera. It's really quite a revelation when you think about it and very empowering for an architect to realize that the design is only one finger on your hand. It's all the other stuff that empowers you in, to such a degree that you can make design decisions and you're suddenly you know, really in a more equivalent position as a team member relative to the person who's paying you. Finally, where we work, we work all over the world on different kinds of projects. And we also work, of course, especially in Los Angeles. So we are not, uh, we're not really, uh, we are very local, but we're kind of, you know, we're, we're global at the same time. So I'm going to, I've organized appropriately, I've organized the projects I'm going to show you. I think I've got like eight of them or so um, by these themes rather than just 
kind of randomly, excess capacity. And if you have questions about where these images are from, I can, I'm happy to answer those at some later point too, but I'm, you know, appropriately, I'm from Los Angeles, so I figured you'd all want to see pictures of movies slipped in here somehow one way or the other. This project um, was first incubated at UCLA when I, um, through a studio I led, it's called Mining to Lining, LA's uh, uh, extra large rights of way. And you can see in the image on the right that there are these three um, yellow kind of caterpillar like look, wormy lake spaces. And what we were looking at was the excess capacity of areas of cities which are unmined. And in this particular case, they are rights of way that used to be taken up by uh, rail lines, which some of you may know were ripped out during the age of the automobile. And, and so the, whereas the train lines, the light rail lines don't exist anymore, the rights of way of them are still there and they're, ex, they're larger than is needed by the, by the roads that, that straddle them. And so we, because there's such a housing shortage in Los Angeles and land is so valuable and it's so hard to find land, that's really the commodity. We explored the idea of whether or not you could make these rights of way a developable for large, for to increase the capacity of the city to accommodate a, a lot of housing, a lot more housing than in um, than the sites that are currently really available. So this is one example, which is out in, um, which is in, um, these are, I'm sorry, these are the three sites. One of them is in South LA. It's an electrical high wire right of way. Another one is an old, is a busway in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and the last one, which we'll focus on more is Venice Boulevard. All of them, again, as I said, used to be, uh, um, light rail rights of way, or actually the latter two were, the one above is, um, are the high wire utilities. So this is what that one look, this is the one in the valley on 98th street, which is now a busway, but it's, there's a lot of extra land in the parkway and it crosses through three neighborhoods. We obviously did population, ethnicity and income research demographically, just to determine uh, what the makeup of those communities were. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. That's what this looks like. So we looked at the dimensions of each of these, which verified the fact that there was enough developable land here. Even in the middle, 30 feet is enough of a depth that you could actually put in housing. And don't forget the fact that, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now about whether or not the radiation from these high, these, uh, high power lines actually has certain health repercussions for people. So the idea of undergrounding it starts becoming an impetus for changing the use of that land because it's a matter of public safety. Would you not rather have housing here than having high wires? So it becomes, whereas the neighborhood might oppose housing ordinarily here, it becomes a kind of quid pro quo for something more, more, uh, more negative. The, here's the Orange County uh, bus line which runs between two other neighborhoods in Van Nuys, Lake Balboa. This is what it looks like. You've got 80 feet between those two rights of way for the, I mean, the roadways, which are, are more than adequate themselves. So plenty of room there. And then this one, which I'm gonna focus on, which is Venice Boulevard, which is about a mile and a half through, the, through a town called, uh, through an area of LA called, called Mid City. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, here it is. This is a little bit more complex because you can see that you've got, because the medians are kind of, are broken into, th the median is kind of broken into three segments with those road and the roadways are too wide. Here's another part of it. And here's a third part of it. This is all part of that same mile and a half sort of changing. So what we do is, what we did was we did an excess land study, which you can see in pink. That is to say, if you were to actually look at the amount of road you needed uh, versus the amount of road that's there, you would, you would get a fair amount of pink um, that you could identify in this overview. Furthermore, we did a traffic study to indicate that basically there was, no, there was really, no, there was an insufficient amount of traffic to worry about there being congestion 
if you narrowed the traffic lanes. In other words, we had to prove that narrowing the traffic lanes was not going to compound congestion. The only place you have some, com some congestion is at one end at the eastern end of the, um, of the corridor. Then the big move was to, to consolidate all of that land that was broken up into little pieces in order to create these developable parcels in the center of the road while putting the, the road each direction on a road diet um, which was only two lanes in either direction with a turning radi with a turning lane as well, yielding blocks that varied in three widths. Um, so here you can, and then we did another version where you showed if you were to put the uh, the development in the center, I'm sorry, the development on the two sides. So in this here you can see if you did a figure ground, how much all of those big black bars that you see running down the center, that all is building volume. And these are the land uses showing that you could do a mixture of land uses. Most of it is housing, is multiple dwelling, but you could also pepper in some open space zones like for farmers markets in certain portions of it as well. So it doesn't need to all be consistent of a same consistent land use. And then of course, and then we did dimensional studies and then came the proof of whether or not this would yield good urban spaces. So we did a series of sectional studies that showed that in fact, the scale of the streets in either direction was actually much nicer than you would have currently and much safer because you wouldn't have children racing across a huge right of way and um, kind of fearing for their lives or the, the fear fear for their children's lives of the, of the neighbors that might ordinarily oppose a project like this. And then we did some massing studies. We showed another block where it's wider, where you could break the block into two narrower blocks with a kind of pedestrian courtyard back alley in the center to get light. So we tested all three widths and we basically generated this series of three uh, prototypes or typologies of housing based upon the different widths that you found within Venice Boulevard. You can see the widest being over on the east, second widest in the west, and then it pinches a little bit in the center. And then we gave the students each of one of those blocks, each student was awarded one of the blocks to develop as an individual architectural project, but they had to deal with the design constraints, um, the parameters, uh, or the design guidelines that were set in motion by the by the uh, urban design study. This is what that looks like. And now the most uninteresting part or most visually boring part, but one which I think you need to really see to appreciate, which is I would bring you over to the right column called land value. And you can see that when you add up, if you were to get all of that new land created, and this is the transit agency, not being a transit agency anymore, but thinking as a real estate developer, you could create land value out of nothing. What right now has no land value because it's just extra wide real estate. What we had to show them was that if you entitled those new parcels that you created by reconfiguring the roadways, you could ascribe value to those entitled parcels and then sell them off to developers. And you would make approximately $67 million. This is from five years ago. That would enable them to pay for all of the street and utility work that would reconfigure this and it would all pay itself back. So instead of just thinking about ticket revenue from fare from ridership, they actually would get in the business of real estate development to do this. And okay, this one's a little... A little technical here, but I wanted to show it because I think even though you're students, you would um, you you would maybe appreciate this idea a little bit of what I'm talking about, which is that um, um, the typical way that you develop things is you get things entitled, um, and then a developer comes in and they get things entitled. That means they change how much you can build, the rules about how much you can build. And then um, you have a certain amount of risk that you take. 
but you take a lot of risk up front with those three dollar signs. I'm looking at the left image. And then you take less risk later. But on the right hand side, you the by the by the by the sit by the county undertaking this this proposal that we put together, there's very limited risk to both the architect and to the developer, because all of the entitlement is being done by the county. And then it's being when it's being sold, it's sold already entitled, ready to build to the amount that the developer wants. So it's a much different way of doing real estate development that is much more attractive to developers. And, um, and so <clears throat> um, as you can see, when I talk about design strategy as business plan, this is what I'm talking about, about how you're embedding an idea, an architectural idea with, with other things that appeal to people who don't care about how things look, but it gets you what you want. So anyway, this is just a little bit more about how all of that works. Now I'm gonna just go on. I know I'm probably going way over right now, but um, this is another one, which is a project at an architectural scale. It's an old parking garage in downtown LA. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it's part of a big commercial mixed use development that's adjacent to it, to the upper right with those two towers next to it. But what's most, what I wanted to point attention to was that in the time between when the project was built, this parking garage in the 1970s and today, the city changed the zoning code so that park, the requirements about the size of parking spaces uh, changed to be much smaller, significantly smaller. Um, it may not seem like a lot, but they got smaller by, you know, by a fair amount by in like, one and a half feet on the side of a parking space and like three feet on in the long direction. And you think, well, what difference does that make? But what it does is when you multiply the implications of that change, it turns out that you can park the same number of parking spaces in the garage and have a lot, a, a considerable amount of, par, of, of garage space left over because the cars don't take up as much room when you put them next to each other. And so what we did, we started to redeploy, collect all of that excess space, and we put it on one side, one and a half sides of the block of parking garage, as you could see at the bottom, to create a new frontage on that garage. And we started to fill it with a fitness club, theater, restaurants, offices, bowling, retail, and so on and so forth. Then we moved the pedestrian circulation from the center of the garage out to the front on the outside, we externalized it. And then basically it, the whole thing became like a kind of form of vertical urbanism where you, you, could walk, you could travel up along the front facade of the building between all of this vertical mixed use that was really just in front, you know, a frontispiece for all of the parking that was behind. And by the way, as you can see in the sections, also incentivize people to take space there, tenants, because you could park your car right behind your office or in between your office space. And, and Angelinos, even though it makes no sense, much prefer to park right next to where they're going, even though there may be an elevator from wherever, you, whatever level you park on. If, if where you're going is on the fifth floor, you'll drive all the way up to the fifth floor. So we did a study model to really examine this. And then we basically did some views of what you would see from the mixed use from the commercial space courtyard that's just to the north of it, looking at these things as you would see through the facade marquetry pattern to see parking sometimes cut out at other times see offices, kind of startup offices poking out very sort of cinemagraphically. Uh, new forms of social space. Our second one, this is a digitally enabled park um, public space on, on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. The question, they wanted to create a digital public, what they called a digital public space prototype of how to rethink the billboard in a way where it wasn't something that was just necessarily advertising, but it could be seen as a catalyst for getting people to actually gather as pedestrians. So it's a weird kind of, um, kind of mix up, mix of something, the billboard connected with, with auto 
with automobiles and pedestrians kind of experiment. So we created a kind of mise-en-scene by kind of prop work of different kinds of pieces of things that had projection on it together with the pedestrian space that would be kind of sitting on a, a sort of stage of sorts in front of it. So with the sight lines geared toward the movement of traffic in either direction. So you could see things. So this is a, this is a view of that space of the installation, not, not something that only for our viewing, not something that you actually would see from sunset, but just so that you can understand what it actually looks like as it's assembled. But you'll see that as you actually are on sunset walking, the spaces um, actually are, are put together um, in a very particular kind of perspectival way that the images blend together as you move. Oops. The billboards are such that they carry images which are borne by projectors that are looking down on a green screen stage so that you can be laying down on the stage and have your image projected on something of a different background like a rock wall so that as people are driving by, they can't see your actual body, but they can see you, the projection of your body kind of playing with the interaction between real people playing around on the stage and the images that they're transformed into uh, as part of um, up on the, on the screen. Going in the other direction, these, these kind of stanchions, sort of like Cadillac Ranch in Texas, are, um, are kind of shown in series and they lock together as well as you're driving past it as a single image. And then they break apart as you drive, as you drive past it. Um, managing change resilience. We did an installation when I first came to Gensler um, um, for street furniture. It was an exhibition of, um, it was a, a kind of fair for people involved in the electric car and um, kind of um, autonomous vehicle industry uh, about four, four or five years ago that was being held in Los Angeles for the first time. And we came up with an idea that they were going to finance to think about how, what the implications were gonna be for pedestrian space um, on account of the autonomous vehicle. We looked at that, we kind of created this dichotomy about how, how jarring it must've been in European cities that had never seen automobiles before when autos entered the city for the first time and how the inverse is true in Los Angeles when then they're doing repair to the freeways. The freeways are vacated and, and how equally odd it is that you people could flock into the freeways and hold a dinner party on the freeway in a way that was forbidden except during certain hours. And that there was something very intriguing about the way in which you could actually be occupying a space that had been dedicated to one purpose um, in another kind of way for the first time. The site was located on this block called Colleton Street in the arts district, which has no, ironically, has no sidewalks. So we did some early studies looking at how an autonomous vehicle would be able to traverse this block um, depending upon the time of day and where, where things were set up there because the, that is something that, uh, that autonomous vehicles have an ability to do that regular people driving cars do not. And then we began to stage different scenarios over a daily schedule about how the furniture could be set up to change this is what the director of uh, transportation for city of LA calls play streets, where one, at some time it can be a panel discussion, at other times it can be a gallery, at others a bar crawl and a fashion show. And we started to develop a module. Again, we're talking about finding the scale at which we do things. We decided, we developed, we wanted to come up with the idea of modules that fit together, but could be reassembled in differing combinations. We worked on thousands of them and eventually came up with something a lot akin to the lower right, which was six pieces that fit together into a block that was about three feet by 12 feet by five feet. It looks like this when it's all fitted together, but it comes apart, the pieces, and can be put together in radically different arrangements 
for differing uses. And that's what we staged each day. We reassembled the furniture on Colleton Street in differing fashions. Here was the table of contents, so to speak, of how you could create small groups, then bigger groups of things, and then um, and then put them in the street. Moreover, that they would be made out of fiberglass and be able to be lit and actually enabled with sound um, at the same time. And then we had them manufactured. Um, and this is the, these are the final results. This was up for about five days. Not really, as you notice there, they, they nominally serve certain functions, but they, they are not, it's not about form follows function. I learned a long time from a, the artist Vito Acconci that the minute somebody sees too obviously what something is made to be, it will only be used in that way. So they had to be sufficiently ambiguous that people would be creative about how they chose to actually use them and appropriate them. And here they are packed up again, back into their, into their modules. How am I doing on time? I can see that we're already, we're getting toward four. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Resilience. So I want to talk a little bit about the title slide um, that you know you saw in the postcard, which is some work we did in Wuhan. This you would call sort of more traditionally urban design. Uh, Wuhan. There's a lot to talk about here beyond COVID. This was pre-COVID, but the Yangtze River, as many of the Chinese students know, Wuhan is considered to be the Chicago of China. It exists because it's a transportation hub. It's a transportation hub primarily of um, trains, a train hub, but it originally was a transportation hub based upon river traffic. And what ended up happening was that um, it was a very, a huge city that, a very large bustling city as a function of the fact that people would moor here their boats and they would deliver things. But over time with climate change, um, the relationship between the river and the construction of the dam upriver, the the relationship between the river level and the town has rad radically shifted such that the river started becoming an active threat to the very subsistence of the town because it could no, be, no longer be relied upon not to flood the town. And so the town erected levee walls along the rivers, much as in the case with New Orleans. And in doing so, it effectively cut off the river as a both a scenic and recreational amenity for the citizens of the city. So our charge, we were working on this uh, one section, OMA was working on another one, and I think Sasaki a third, um, of different ways in which you could strategize how to reconnect the city with its riverfront. This is the, um, what's called the first bridge in Wuhan, which was, which is considered a a kind of icon in it. And there were two sites we worked on. This was a bridge that connected the two sites. The first site I'm going to show you is on this is on the foreground side of this of this photograph. So these are some historic photographs. Mao is known to have come down here and swum uh, swam in the river as well. But there's a yearly swim from one side of the river to the other. But also sort of like in India, people gather by the river very oddly just to sit on the stairs. Sometimes they they kind of just wade in. Uh, but there's really, I mean, it's a very low level degree of enjoyment. So we started with a kind of idea about how to extrapolate something from what we found at the site in the form of the, the first bridge. And we looked at a way that we could work with the rampart of the bridge itself to begin to organize the site from those ramparts where the bridge launched to um, and those and those began to lead to a kind of network of connections that we began to use to to as threads to weave the portions of the city that previously had been behind the levee across to things that were out in front of the levee itself that were floating and like uh, that were on pontoons that rose and rose up and down along with the tidal change in the river itself 
those started in turn forming different territories of land use. And then we began to place different, uh, different functions, different uh, programs in, in different places, some of which were behind the, what had been the levy wall and others of which were in front. And the idea was really to dissolve the barrier, but to do so in such a way that some of the walkways, these threads were on pontoons that had the ability to rise and fall like the ramps and what you see in the foreground with the, with the change in river level, while the other things stayed more stable like the park, the tea pavilions and, and that which was behind it. So it looks a little bit like this from the aerial. It also led back to a, um, to a, well, a very famous kind of pagoda, which is to, you see in the very uh, bottom right. Um, and what you can see here a little bit um, is two different sections that we've taken through the water as, as how things kind of come down to the water and ways in which we ended up starting to find places where you could break through the levee and create other ways of forming barriers without it looking like a wall necessarily, but providing access down. And this is, this is it built. In China, it's always kind of a mixed bag because you end up, there, there ends up being some things lost in translation, but there's some aspects of it which really maintain the spirit of what we had sought to do in the final product. This is the other site, um, which is on the other side of the, which is more a rather other side of the Yangtze and it's near a diplomatic area more. The other, the first site I showed you is the, the old historic quarter. This is more the diplomatic quarter, several centuries older. And it's that, that kind of crescent shaped piece of land that's on the far side of the bridge. That is where we focused. This is what that looked like many centuries ago. Again, I mentioned about the, the kind of uh, trade history on the water, but this is what it looks like today. It's pretty awful, even though you see a remnant of that same that same use, but the but the effect of climate change on the radical change in water level has made it really uh, disincentivizing for people to to use and engage the river as part of urban life. These are called weirdly they're called balconies, but they're really they're places you can go like restaurants and other things to go out to do something, but just not something that you particularly would find very scenic or pleasurable. These are just some, some pictures showing, showing you the same thing from different perspectives. So yeah, and these are some recent floods that happened while we were working on the project. So it's quite an active thing, not just when there are heavy rains, but this is just, they can be having a heavy rain elsewhere in China that will impact the Yangtze River levels radically. It, it can change as much as 90 meters it's, it's really scary how much um, the river changes in its height. And we did a bunch of diagnostics about barriers to getting to the river, as well as the, even just visual, visual barriers that prevent you from actually seeing it. So we developed this idea, we called it a kind of string of pearls, very similar to the other side, where we basically had arterials of different, for different types of transportation serve as threads, which wove the site together, but also, created a kind of interlacing of water and land. And then we began to place these kind of satellites or islands um, in, the, in the interstices between, between all of the arteries, which floated, again, were similarly on pontoons and became either vegetative or programmatic kind of destinations or places that you could visit which felt like you were it was clearly urban there was there was program going on and destinations but it was clearly in the water it was some kind of mixture of um of environments that was neither urban nor uh, part part just um boat uh boat centered and it became kind of its own sort of destination. And we called them, we kind of referred to them as sort of like lotus pads or water lilies, something the Chinese really like, 
metaphor for for entitling things but it was it was an instigation for a way of creating an urbanism that was kind of water that was kind of water centered this has not been built yet but uh they're working on developing a variant of it as well here there there's some drawings that show if you keep your eye on the left side where the water is how the water level changes um up and down well i don't have this in such a good order for you but the water level can float up and down and you can see how certain of those those areas could could float there were dam like walls and then the um, that would enable kind of creating lagoons like man-made lagoons but then within that the boardwalks and the water lilies would um, would be able to float up and down with them okay now we're I've got two more projects so you can you can stop me Mona if it's uh, or Maria if you want but I think I can go through here fairly fairly quickly building equity um, the first one is for United Way. Uh, they are not a developer. They're a nonprofit, but they're an, uh, an advocate, a housing advocate, in, um, and a very powerful one in Los Angeles. And we worked with a couple of people from different disciplines who helped write a kind of Rosetta Stone for us of how to crack the zoning code in order to hack it and, and develop something that would enable us to do things that um, that right now are are kind of discouraged. The premise of the initiative that we were exploring was that there, whereas land is very, very hard to find in Los Angeles, as I mentioned with the extra large right of way, small lots, there are hundreds and hundreds of small lots that are uh, actually thousands of small lots, 50 by 150 throughout Los Angeles, which are available for development. But because of all the regulations that are tied to building supportive housing no developer wants to work on those because they don't yield as they we like to say there's the the juice isn't worth the squeeze there's not for all of the headaches that you have to go through to get a project entitled and built you you need to do a project of enough size to make it worth your while our idea was or their idea was that if you could if you could develop them in batches by having repetitive prototypes, you could you could achieve those same numbers by say doing six sites or 10 sites at a time. So the idea was small lots by right, meaning no entitlements, you don't have to change any zoning or ask for any variances. You go to shared housing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you have a single financing source, which United Way developed a philanthropic equity fund and it's repeatable. So we had a data scientist develop a roster of the thousands of sites throughout Los Angeles with the, where the filter was that it had to be fairly underutilized the land so that it made no so that it made sense to demolish whatever was there as opposed to something that was already heavily built upon. It had to be the right zoning which is a C an RD 1.5 an R3 or an R4 slash C2 and it had to have an alley at the back. The reason the alley was important, and there are over 90 miles of alleys in Los Angeles, is that that would be the key to how you get the parking into the project without dragging your car all the way through the site and taking up a lot of room. These are maps that we made based upon the data scientists research of all of the alleys that exist throughout Los Angeles. And um, anyway, these are for two different zoning uh, categories. The first one I'm going to show you, there were three prototypes. The first one is on C2 R4 lots. Again, there's an alley behind it. It's on, these tend to be more on bigger boulevards, but it's in this case, it's two small lots next to each other. And we got over 30 units on it, but because it's permanent supportive housing, there's no parking required. So you can make very efficient use of these. They're very small units, but you can get 30 units in and you don't need to have an elevator. You can keep it, you can get a, a lot of really nice outdoor space, a kind of nice scaling down from the boulevard down to the single family neighborhood that happens to be to the lower left. And it's a sense of community that's engendered as well, even though these are all people who are uh, formerly homeless, but have some 
sense that they're not living in such an institutional setting. So again, this is an idea of fit, finding a lot that you wouldn't otherwise look at and trying to think about and to prove the potential of what these things could, could yield. The second one was on our, oh, the second two, this is the first one of them, were on our D1.5 and our R3 lots, which are small, lower density. This case, these are, we're showing multiple ones because again, I'm talking about a prototype that can be repeated. And in this particular case, we were able to get something like um, 20, 28, uh, 28 bedrooms. The idea of thinking not about units, but bedrooms um, that were, that were, had these exterior terraces that could be opened up to the outdoor by the use of operable shutters. And what's important about this scheme, um, which is the idea, if you look at the plan on the left side, again, this is the idea of where does the sweet spot lie in the innovation? You'd think that it was about urban, you know, urban design, but it actually turns out to be about the unit, which is that if you look down at the very bottom of the plan, there's a, there's a stair that comes up and then right off that stair, there's no hallway, you walk through a you walk through a gate and that gate um, brings you into an outdoor space um, and you then are able to actually go, go either into a living room or into any one of four bedrooms. This means that it doesn't have to be a family, but that they could actually rent this to, if it was a family of two, they could rent out the other two bedrooms, sublease them and have help with their, with their, um, um, with their, with their lease, um, or it could be a bigger family. But the point is that these bedrooms, which have um, a kitchenette and a, a little work area as well as a, as a bathroom are sufficient for somebody who's either falling to homelessness or is just coming out of college or high school who needs a place independently to live, but could rent this for under $1,000 a month, which is a, a is unheard of in Los Angeles. So what makes this project work is that even though there are only six units or 11 units in these buildings, depending upon which zoning it is, there are 28 bed beds. So we say think beds, not units, because it's a way of hacking into the code using the ability to build what are called guest rooms um, and accommodating more people than is, a, 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 than is overtly or ostensibly allowed by the zoning code while still not having to ask for a variance. This is one other version, a different version of the same with the same objectives, which are two littler buildings with a courtyard between. Same thing in terms of the unit capacity. Here, that's the you see the, be, the front unit, the front building on the right and the back building on the left and you park under and to the side of the building on the on the left. This is just for affordable housing, not for, for homeless. And then in this unit, you come up the stair at the top left and you arrive not in a build, not in a unit, you arrive at a patio. And you can see that in this particular case, you can go off the patio into a unit, which is two bedrooms, but there's also independent access to a third bedroom, bedroom one, and to an office that could be sublet to another person, enabling the prime leaseholder to be able to afford their, their higher rent and also to afford the sub lessor um, a, a very inexpensive way of living. These used to be called in Los Angeles boarding houses, and it still is allowed in the code, in the zoning code, but nobody takes advantage of it. So if you got room, if you got time, I've got one more thing to show. Um, which is something we've done very recently, which is called the Grow Home. It's a, it's a starter home. This is about really building equity through purchase for sale, uh, for for sale affordable housing, which is a kind of um, unicorn in Los Angeles. Uh, several things have happened over the last six months or so. The first is that there's been a lot of attention nationally to whatever happened to the starter home, why they're not being built anymore. Of course, the answer is that construction prices and, um, and land have, have escalated so much. But beyond that, there's just a disinterest in that. Actually, architects used to design 
I understand something like 95% of homes in the United States in the post-war era, immediately following World War II, now they only build around 3% of the homes built in the United States. At any rate, the, the kicking in of this, uh, this additional factor, which is uh, legislation in California called SB9, basically was what instigated this study, which is basically that you can now take an R1 lot in Los Angeles, that's a single family lot, and you are legally able to subdivide your single family home lot into four lots and sell them off, which is radically radical. So we took the, the 90 miles of alleys and what we learned from the United Way study that are mostly largely underutilized and perceived as unsafe. And we looked at them as an alternate means of accessing a property whereby somebody who, the homeowner who, who owns the lot today, the main house in black, has a problem. They have children who are going to college and they have not saved up for their tuition or housing, or the family doesn't have sufficient funds to retire. So they have a motivation to, to consider a micro development strategy where instead of selling it to a developer, they sell the lots in the back of their property off to two other buyers who buy the properties and develop them themselves according to the design that I'm about to show you. So you take the 50 by 150 site, you divide it into uh, the backside into 50 by 75, and then you subdivide that again into 25 by 75 lots. That's what you see in blue, those, those setbacks, what you're allowed in an envelope. This from uh, our RE American Dream book from way back when, 30 years ago, showed this succession, this process in Los Angeles, where the same house that in 1850 would sit on a rancho, a very large rancho, over a period of time, the house has remained more or less the same, but the amount of land around it has shrunken until um, it becomes basically, the house basically occupies the land itself. And in this particular case, back in 1995, our solution was not that dissimilar, which was to take a single family lot and subdivide it in, into two lots. And that by doing so, you could generate this change from what you see on the left, which is, which is more or less an icon of single family living, which is houses and garages, to something that would be considerably denser on the right, which is two homes that are more with no setbacks that have courtyards. Um, then our, I don't know if I did that or not, I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of it, but um, the, develop, the, the micro development strategy in effect works like this, where as the household changes over time, you build in a micro development strategy whereby you only build the starter home that you absolutely can afford and need on the left side. And as your household grows and your equity grows, you're able to pull money back out of your out of your house to build more house that you see to the left to the right at, um, based upon income from an, an a accessory dwelling unit which is a a rental unit which is built into the original home that generates income to help you with your mortgage and build equity so this is what those homes look like before they're fully built out this is uh, a room that is not yet to become an additional bedroom, but is um, in the short term, simply a courtyard. And this shows the genealogy. If you wanna say finding your roots, this is finding your roots in domestic typology, where you start with those two homes on the left and you show how, as you make different decisions, a family makes different decisions. We looked at different iterations of how you could grow your home in order to meet differing ones of your needs. So we're really developing a kind of product of sorts. Um, and in many ways you could look at it as an IP, is where how does the architect get paid? You get paid because you work with a company that basically develops this as an IP, like a tech company, and somebody invests in your company. You're not dealing with the construction, you're, you're basically least, you know, you've developed the, the micro development strategy and a housing typology to boot. So this provides a kind of nominal, semi-public space that the two units together can share in the center, which you can see here. They kind of uh, yin and yang space out of the center for their own 
accessory use. And these are the lateral views out of each home across that little courtyard between where they kind of avoid each other a little bit. So they're not staring into one another's spaces. And the last slide I wanted to show here was just zooming back out again to, an, to a so-called urban design scale of how incrementally not only the houses change, but they incrementally improve the neighborhood by starting to recover the use of these alleys as community spaces in the making, not simply by making improvements to the paving, but actually the idea that people could live on them, much as the Dutch do through the Voonerf or in Vancouver or Melbourne, they have what they call laneways or in Tokyo, they have other such things. They are an alternative life to that of the main streets. So there's a new form of community and public space that grows out of the problem of equity building. And just like the diagram that I showed you at the beginning of the constellation of interests, sometimes you start from the hub of one interest and this thing creeps out to reach out and connect to some of the other hubs of interest, um, even uh, incidentally, meaning not immediately consciously, but through the opportunities that present themselves and the constraints and other types of objectives that you're trying to reach, which have um, kind of side benefits. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry that it went over a little bit, but um, look forward to any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. While our colleagues are formulating their questions, we would like to invite you to share your thoughts on a prompt we are asking all participants um, in the lecture series. Um, and that question is, what is, in your opinion, the urban question we should be focusing on as designers with the most sense of urgency? Mm. I don't think the, the question is a question of what, um, but rather of who. In other words, I, I really, in terms of what I presented today, I think you can see that, that a lot of problems of what is the problem are related to really who are you, who are you not only designing for who is the population that has a problem and and who would you work with because the who is the bridge between the what you you know what you're going to do what you're trying to solve for and what you're going and how you're how you're going to do it it really is the the medium of translation um it, yeah i think it's it's kind of the who meaning what is the population you're interested in um, and what are they, what's, what's the problem that they're confronting, confronted with, as opposed to looking at a site and going, oh, what's this problem? That's, I think you need to back out, you know, to 10,000 feet. Um, and then you can decide in a way where the, where the solution lies and at what scale to the problem that those people have. Yeah, and I'm very interested in the Stone Soap Group's focus on activating public space. So what strategies do you find more successful to design for the intentional inclusion of diverse publics in the public real, public realm? Hmm. Um, you know, I'm gonna sort of say that um, the problem of public space is probably best um, approached obliquely. Meaning I think that rather than, I have found that the most interesting solutions to questions of public space come by coming across it by solving another problem. Like this one is a good example where you weren't overtly trying to, to work on a problem of public space. You were working on another problem and the public space aspect comes along with it. It's like it's riding in a sidecar of your motorcycle and you're working on something else. And of course there's a public space component because in the end, in this country, in the United States, public space, unlike in Europe or elsewhere is seldom being produced by public agencies. I mean, in Canada, elsewhere, I think public space is oftentimes privately produced or it's incentivized by private money, by private capital. And then the public likes to pitch in some help. 
but but that doesn't mean that um, that I think that uh, shopping centers that are fake public spaces are a good idea. I'm simply saying that I think you need an agent, another agent whose overt intent is not to create public space, but public space ends up being a, a part of the project that they're actually first working on, mainly working on. So it could be a residential developer who needs to create public space as part of their project or a commercial developer or a transportation agency. Do you follow me? And I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think it's a little bit sad that in the United States, you know, that that public agencies don't care about public space creation so much. Um, but I find that it all, oftentimes ends up being something that tags along with another agenda. So for instance, like the LA River, which you probably all read about, that is not about public space creation. It, it's actually was driven by eco, eco, you know, ecology advocates for naturalizing the river. And then it, brought, it got brought along by that as something that should be publicly accessible. So it's it's oftentimes being kind of, um, you know, it's kind of like a guest to the party. And I also think what's good about that is it gives a charge to the nature of the public space. Meaning if there's an agenda of that goes along with it, that drove it, that brought it there, that's a way of making the public space different or unique, as opposed to if you were just told, oh, make a public space. Uh, it's like, well, who is it for? Well, it's a public agency. I mean, it, 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 the, it kind of flattens itself out. I don't mind the fact that there's self-interest. That's what my second book was about. I don't mind the fact that we accept the fact that, that self-interest drives the American city. I think you can harness the self-interest of the American city for good. It's kind of like a Robin Hood model. I, I, you know, I could have called us ourselves the Robin Hood group because we're always trying to rob from the rich and give to the poor. Thank you. Um, thanks, Roger, for this lecture. It's very interesting. Um, I specifically am really interested in housing equity. And I think that um, some of your prototypes and the way that you're thinking about these strategies are very um, innovative. I was wondering how you thought about um, various like populations such as like addressing ableism and neurodiversity um one of the kind of key concepts that like has come about recently is like one fourth of americans are have been considered having some sort of disability mm. um so what do you think about like with housing prototypes any type of like adaptive floor plans to become individual for not just necessarily for disabilities but just more individualized Mm. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, this may surprise you. The answer may kind of surprise you a little bit, but because we've been working a lot in a supportive housing, uh, a lot of the public money that's dedicated to supportive housing comes with comes with a lot of regulation that requires it all be accessible. And so it's almost like we're not having to contort ourselves at all in order to do that. It's almost like it's just assumed in, in many cases that, that everything has to be accessible um, to begin with. It's almost become the kind of normal, at least of that. I think that there are obviously a lot of other, there's a lot of other clients and building types in which you actually need to make a special accommodation for that. But in the case of the supportive housing work that we're doing, you don't get the money unless the th it's a prerequisite that it be all, ex you know, that it be accessible that way. We actually, actually also had a client, a Jewish camp in Malibu, where to my surprise, they, they, their fundraising point, their fundraising platform to, to people who are going to give money philanthropically to rebuild the camp who burned down in the fire was all about universal access. It wasn't about, oh, isn't this nice with nature and, you know, isn't it beautiful and all of this. It was all about, well, it was about sustainability and about universal, universal access. And so they had us kind of focus on pictures and, you know, renderings of stuff that showed how you would be able to navigate the, 
the landscape and the access to all of the buildings off of a really changing landscape topography um, as a kind of selling point, uh, literal selling point uh, for the project. One of the thing that project was particularly interesting because with regard to your question, because we went through a kind of McCargian process that's only going to be known to your instructors what I mean by that, but where we basically determined where to build by where not to build. We basically used a, a deductive process by saying these hills, for instance, these this topography is too steep to get access to build on for people to, to get to their buildings. So we needed to find areas that were of a certain gradient where it would be easier to get to you know you could get into the buildings more easily so it even operates not at just the level of like do you have enough clearance in your bathrooms and your your um your kitchens and counter heights and so on but rather in terms of your site strategy you know site planning which you would not or ordinarily think was kind of such a big deal I, i'm kind of obliquely answering your question but that's the best i can do i think All right, then we take this silence as uh, an <laughs> opportunity to thank Roger. Roger, I, you know, I know there are many, many more questions um, for sure that, you know, are, are going to pop up because I think uh, your talk uh, activated um, a lot of the areas that the students are actively working on from, you know, the scale of the installation to issues around housing and you know both local and obviously also working internationally so i you know i'm i'm sure there are many many other thoughts even if not well formulated questions that are going to be staying with us for for a little bit it's uh, fascinating to see the work i'm just going to um, ask you one last question um before we wrap up sure mona no just leave a couple of minutes for me as, as well sorry okay so um, what, um, because we are, have been working on this notion that uh, the centers, the clusters, in your case, uh, your group, are actually enabling um, a different kind of work, different kinds of responses, different kinds of relationships. Um, what would you say um, is your experience in maybe uh, disrupting, changing, um, creating other opportunities inside Gensler. I think you have been already touching on, on this a little bit, but um, you know, from what you have seen or, or you know, where did you imagine uh, taking things? Is there, are there opportunities for you know, mutual learning? I don't know, can you elaborate a little bit? What can you do under this umbrella that you could not uh, do being cluster in, you know, in a, one of these 14 different sections that you told us that are operating at the same time? So how is I, you know how is this enabling you know a kind of opportunity mm, that um, one of the traditional silos uh, or types will will make possible? Um, well, our group, which is about five people, uh, we're a small group inside of Gensler, but I think we've had a we've had a disproportionately large impact on the, both the office in LA and also firm wide because we've gotten a lot of accolades. Um, for design and various other things. I think the capital, I think through us, Gensler has discovered that there's another form of capital other than economic capital, which is cultural capital. They suddenly realized that having, that being able to talk about community impact, what it likes to call community impact, is a huge selling point from a PR standpoint. So I'm kind of like, that's fine, you know, that's all good. And they're, they're interested in measuring impact. They're really into how do you measure the impact because they think that it's very saleable to clients. I kind of leave that to other people to figure out how to measure. I also don't think that we're particularly good as architects at measuring things. I leave that to Deloitte and other companies like that to figure out how to, what those, those measurables are. Um, but I do like to weaponize community impact for my own good meaning it's given us a sort of fearlessness and daunt, undaunted of interest in just going after stuff that we now feel like we have the authority, moral authority to do. 
because Gensler is a little bit insecure about its own moral authority. And I think they feel like we are a hood ornament for that, that they can now see, you know, put us up in front, out in front of them saying, look at us, look what we're doing. Even though the we is like, you know, our little band of five, um, but it's had a disproportionately large public uh, impact, or at least in terms of um, notoriety, shall we say. So one of the, so I'm always constantly looking to expand our enterprise. Um, it's been a little hard right now because when you're, when you're very grassroots, um, you know, you're, you're only able to expand at a kind of a certain scale and I don't want to lose control over things as well. But there is another part to your point about how we expand our impact um, at Gensler. And I've been asked about that. Like they've told me they want me to try to expand our impact. And they ask, how do you think you could, what can we do to help you? The one other thing that I don't, I didn't mention because I was trying to stay focused today is that I, I run a research program at Gensler. And I wanted to let your students know this. Gensler, Gensler puts in over a million dollars um, in research money firm wide um, to, to, re, to do research, both firm wide and in each individual office, which is not a lot of offices do that. Arup does it very well in many ways better than us. But, um, but I use that as an opportunity to start seeding. In fact, I think we may have a couple of Gensler people that are in my group who are involved, have done several of these research projects. We have about $50,000 just in the LA office alone in Gensler grants. You can get two types of grants from Gensler. And you guys both know Maria and Mona that getting grants in academia is extremely competitive. It's difficult. You know, the gram only, you know, the gram, you're lucky if you get $7,500, if you get it. Here you can get $15,000 and then you get it every year. You can, you can do it. But we've actually had a strange experience of like not finding enough people who who are interested enough, we get more people saying, oh, I'm so busy with my other projects, blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> to my earlier point, that's a, we've weaponized that. And so I kind of serve as a backseat driver to come up with ideas, to brainstorm ideas that I'm interested in. And then I go try to find protagonists at the office outside of our group to say, how about doing this? here's an idea, go for it. And then I'm on the jury, right? I run the committee. So it's like, okay, I'm the judge and the executioner. Um, let's plant that idea. And then that thing, either that or through BD, business development, we incubate the projects with business development money or research money. And then that's how we get the rot, the stone. The st you always go, well, where does the stone? How do you, how do you, you can't just come with a word. You actually have to come with a picture. Mm -hmm. So I use, I use that both to, to create a virus inside of the office to try to get people talking about things and to also create stones that I can then take out and start to look for people who are interested in things. So it's, it's kind of, to put it crassly, it's also a very high level form of marketing, but it's the, it's a best form of marketing because you're not just saying, oh, hi, you know, we've done 16 libraries. You're saying, no, hi, we have, an, we have ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. do you want to look into our chest of ideas? So I think it's, I think I'm answering your question. Yes, you are. Uh, yeah. And if you are taking applications, I'm sure you are going to get a few from mm -hmm. some of our students. So you are thinking we absolutely do. That's a nice to the arm to engage an academic partner. I'm sure, you know, we will also be, you know, ready to jump We in. are. I've been working on doing that too, which is trying to engage academic partnerships. Because um, Gensler, they always like to say, we don't, we're not AECOM. We don't give $100,000 to Harvard, you know, okay. to go to a studio. What mm -hmm. Gensler does is say, look, we don't have money but we have network. And if you're willing to partner with us, we can bring our network to bear. So my idea of a, of a partnered studio is to, to have juries which are, look more like Shark Tank than they do like Harvard, mm -hmm. where you, have, you bring venture capitalists to come to look at the ideas and tell people, oh, this is a great idea. This could really happen. I will give you money for this. 
mm. versus somebody telling you, you know, an academic telling you, oh, you know, I think this is beautiful or it's not. I mean, it's a mixture, obviously. Um, but I think there's different definitions of beauty. Yep. And I think beauty is also like, is I define as also being impactful or, you know, can this have tremendous effect that, that there's beauty in an idea, not just what form something takes. I have, I have some really fantastic little stones that I would like to put into the hands of some of your employees so that they can apply for these grants and then partner with us. That is a good, good, good model. That sounds great. I'm going through our alumni network and see who's working with Gensler at the moment. So please do great opportunities. Roger, thank you so much. This was an amazing discussion. I mean, an amazing talk. I, I took so many screenshots. I can't even tell you. I mean, you might have heard <laughs> this. I'm, I, I think there are many, many questions that, I mean, at least I have on my side. I hope I can approach you. I would love to interview actually for one sure. of my books. Um, you mentioned the word prototype too often. So I really have to tap into this once more. So thank you so much. It my was an absolute amazing, pleasure. An amazing uh, last lecture for this semester. And um, yeah, I, I also, I mean, do you have internship positions open? Because students are at the moment also all applying. So <laughs> Yes, we do have an internship program. It's, get, it's getting a little bit late but you should look into it. Uh, all of the offices do, inter most of our offices everywhere have internships. I think that we used to, before COVID, have 40 positions. I don't know this year if we'll have quite that many, but um, usually the applications are due in January hmm. um, and it's pretty competitive, um, but you should look it up because it may, it may still be okay. And it's a great way to get to know Gensler. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Roger. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.